thank you so much, Provost. Uh, I'm, I'm glad to have met you and had a brief chance to try. Um, thanks to the Dean Danowitz, uh, Angela Wiseman, who's been taking good care of me since I arrived here, uh, Leslie Word, Kathy Trundle, and everyone else from the College of Education who made me welcome here last night and today. I also want to thank uh, a young man who's with us from Chapel Hill, middle school student named Ike Bryant, who's uh, going to be leading one of the panels. Uh, extraordinary young man who uh, has a real vision of social justice in America. And finally, thanks to each and every one of you, the uh, school administrators, uh, principals, teachers, students, parents, folks from the community, and I don't know, I'll say everybody else in North Carolina. <laughs> are there any students here, um, undergrad or grad students, who are planning to be teachers? Where are you? Raise your hand up. Oh, I'm so glad. I'm really glad. Some, some of you look so young to me. It, it renews my spirits just, just to be with you. Hope we'll get to talk a lot later on today. Um, I spent a lot of time with young teachers who are just starting their careers. And my friends, I have spent almost my entire life working with some of the poorest children in America. I started way back in 1964 uh, as a teacher in the deeply racist and profoundly segregated public schools of Boston, Massachusetts, my hometown. I had never intended to become a teacher. I'd gone to Harvard, and sorry about that, <laughs> and uh, majored in English literature, and then gone off to Oxford on a Rhodes scholarship, and and spent some time in Paris uh, studying literature with some of the great American writers who were living in Paris at the time, including um, the uh, great uh, American novelist uh, William Styron, who wrote um, uh, one of the major books about the Holocaust, Sophie's Choice. You remember that? And uh, also the great Richard Wright, who's probably the most respected black American author of that time. Came back to Boston in 1964 and was about to go back to university. I would have been happy to spend the whole rest of my life uh, teaching Elizabethan literature. That's what I love. Um, and I probably would have done that if it weren't for the rising passions of the civil rights movement that were sweeping across the nation at that time, when thousands of young people, some from the South, some from the North, black and white together, were doing their best to break the back of apartheid in, in, in America. And um, I don't know what happened, but it struck me very hard suddenly. Uh, that this was a calling to my generation. And I didn't want to watch history. I wanted to enter history. I wanted to be part of it. So I got in my little car one day. This was the 1960s. So you can bet it was a very little car. It was a VW bug. And I drove across town from the university into the heart of the black community of Boston. I had lived around Boston my whole life, and I'd never been there before. And I went to a black minister who was the um, was Episcopal minister, who was the local representative of Dr. King, and I simply said to him, may I be of any use? And he said, yes, young man, you can be. Um, you've had a very privileged education I'd like to see you share it with our children. Why don't you become a teacher? So I just walked into the Boston School Department the next day and I announced, I'm going to be a teacher. <laughs> I've never heard of certification, you know. 
And they said, where did you go to college? And I told them. And they said, well, then you can't be a teacher. <laughs> you can't learn anything useful at Harvard. <laughs> so um, I said, there must be some way I could do it. And they said, well, you could be a sub. I said, what the heck? Why not? So um, I became a sub. They called it a provisional teacher. And uh, the first time I ever taught in my life, they put me into kindergarten. <laughs> I was absolutely terrified. And I had no idea what you do with people that size. To, to me, they were like gerbils. Um, and them crawl all over me. But I survived. And so they, they promoted me to fourth grade. And, um, and, I, and I went on to teach for several years. But um, I did not teach for very long in that particular school because of a great mistake I made. Uh, at some point in the end of the year, I had, by the way, you know, 34 children, almost all black, and um, they had had, um, let's see, they'd had 12 provisional teachers before me that year and the two preceding years. So you could imagine uh, their basic skills you know, at that point were richly devastated. And by the way, you know, 40 years, 30 years later, when they have children, of course, we'll condemn them for not reading to their kids at, at night, right? We're, we're very good at scapegoating our victims from one generation to the next. Um, the, those kids didn't trust me. Why should they trust me? Another white guy after 12 people have already abandoned them. So it was very hard to win them over. And there's one little girl in that class, a, a tall and strikingly beautiful um, black, blue black girl who was taller than the other kids. And somehow she had some kind of profound recognition of what was being done to them. Uh, and she sat in the back row as far from me as possible. And she looked at me with this glaring look of, distrust and anger in her eyes. And one day, I w we had no black literature in the school, so one day I went over to Harvard Square and I went to a college bookstore and I picked up a brand new, handsome book, The Selected Poems of Langston Hughes, and brought it into class the next day. Before I even opened the book, I had it in my hand. I heard a little girl in the front row whisper to another little girl. Look, she said, that man's colored. I just heard that. And I opened the book, and I read the poem to the children. And it was a poem that I'm sure many of you know very well. Perhaps some of you know it by heart. It's a poem that asks, what happens to a dream deferred? Does it dry up like a brazen in the sun? And, you know, for the first time all year, you could have heard a pin drop in that classroom. Every child was on the edge of their chairs, and suddenly that little girl in the back row, who had bitterly disliked me all year long, suddenly got up, and she walked around the room, and came right up to me, and she gently touched my shoulder like that, and she said, thank you. And then she said, could I bring that book home and show it to my mom? I was so happy, I would have given her my car. <laughs> and the next day she came in and recited the entire poem. I, I never asked children to memorize poetry. She did it on her own. And the next day, I was fired from the Boston Public Schools because um, Langston Hughes was not on the list of standards for fourth grade. Yeah, we had standards in those days, too. And this misery is not a new invention. Um, and, um, uh, so, you know, and, and, and it was a big deal in Boston, you know, and the New York papers picked it up. And the networks came up because it was unusual. The headline in the paper was, Rhodes Scholar Fired from Fourth Grade. 
and charge against me. Well, this was no fooling. This was on the paper. It was curriculum deviation. <laughs> Funny way our country works, at least in those days. Um, one month later, I was hired by the Johnson administration uh, to do curriculum development. <laughs> I worked on the first English curriculum for Upward Bound. Um, and you know, in one way or another, I've been working with poor children ever since. So. For most of the past two decades, in a, a section of New York, a section of the South Bronx, uh, which was then and is today uh, the poorest municipal uh, congressional district in the nation. I've written several books about those kids. Um, one of them is called The Shame of the Nation. It's about the, um, the return of, of segregated education to this nation. And uh, another was called Savage Inequalities. I, I wish I could tell you that uh, there's been dramatic progress uh, since I wrote those books, but that would not be true. The Savage Inequalities in funding and other uh, frequently unnoticed resources for our public schools uh, have not diminished with the years. And even in districts of low-income children, where it may appear that funding is equal or a trifle greater than in the wealthy suburbs, um, even in those neighborhoods, even in those districts, it's usually not so. Uh, after you adjust the numbers for the vastly greater pedagogic needs of children who grow up in destitution. And I might add to that, uh, it's widely known, the sort of a dirty little secret in America now, that even when it looks like the states are providing a token of equality in funding, um, uh, some of the wealthy districts just go out and raise private extra money on their own. Did you know that? Does that happen even in North Carolina? In New York City, even within a district, parents in the wealthiest neighborhoods will hold fundraising parties. And like on the Upper East Side of Manhattan, where distinguished people like Donald Trump live, um, you'd see um, a wonderful New Yorker. Um, you'll, you'll see um, the parents will hold it. A big fundraiser, and they'll invite some prestigious artist, you know, to draw people there, and they'll raise like half a million dollars in one night. And what do they do with that? At a time when class size is ex is rising, they'll use it to diminish class size for their children. Uh, at a time when resources are scarce, they'll um, build a library for their children. In one school, they built a rooftop planetarium so that their children could gaze upon the stars. And they're not obliged to share a single cent of that with schools that serve the poor. Even more disheartening to anyone like me, like me who grew up in the days when Dr. Martin Luther King was still alive, uh, even more heartbreaking is America's apparent willingness to turn back the clock and give up on the dream of racial integration in our public schools. For many years, Wake County, like much of North Carolina, was um, one of the most enlightened sections of the nation in fostering diversity in, in public education. It was a bright and shining model. First, it was done in strictly racial terms, and later by using the economic level of, of a child as a surrogate for race. Uh, that was a marvelous thing. Uh, and for much of that time, there was a governor here, uh, Governor Hunt, or something, who was, you know, was a model for the nation. Um, but starting in 2010, um, a school board majority, I won't go into detail about how it was elected because 
Uh, this is not supposed to be a partisan event. Um, it's hard to avoid it nowadays. A, a school and majority um, um, of, his, of historical amnesiacs um, initiated measures to rip apart the legacy of Martin Luther King and the and Brown versus Board of Education and dragged the county back in the direction of Plessy versus Ferguson. Although they were forced to modify their plans by opposition from the NAACP and enlightened sectors of the population, they did succeed in doubling the number of, of high poverty, high, highly segregated public schools. This, of course, is not unique uh, to Raleigh or, or, or to this county. Uh, this is happening all over. And as, you put, as some of you may not know, it's even worse in the major northern cities of America. Uh, but Wake County, you know, it, it was this bright and shining model of transformation. So, you know, that's why it would be doubly sad if, if even here the uh, dream of Dr. King should be consciously dishonored and betrayed. Now why do I speak of this with so much intensity? Here's one reason. Because schools of education never talk about this, and they should. You know, they, they'll spend hours and hours of discussion about how to turn around an apartheid school. <laughs> but they won't talk about segregation in itself. And if they won't, who will? Anyway, I'm sure this, this university is the one exception. <laughs> but there's another reason I'm so passionate about this. I'm old enough so I remember Dr. King. When I, after I was fired from Boston schools, black community was very loyal to me. And when Dr. King came <coughs> to give the first, his first major speech in Boston, at a, at a historically famous place called Boston Common. You ever heard of that? A lot of Revolutionary War battles were fought there. When he came to speak to this huge crowd, um, black leaders asked me if I would like to walk with him and be one of his bodyguards. Look at me. <laughs> I was a skinny dweeb from Harvard, but um, there was a a matter of solidarity. And I remember his voice. I remember his eyes. And I remember the perspiration pouring down his brow. That's why he always had the handkerchief in his pocket to mop his brow. And I remember his words. Um, and I remember the exact words of his dream. Um, Dr. King did not say, I have a dream that someday in the East and West and North and South, we will have slightly higher scoring, test-driven, anxiety-loaded, separate and unequal schools. That was not his dream. He did not say someday. He did not say somebody. Somebody, somebody turn my mic off. There it is. I, I know there's an enemy one somewhere in the middle. Um, um, you know, he did not say someday we will have apartheid schools with high expectations. He did not say someday we'll have separate and unequal schools with turnaround artists cruising into town. Um, that was not his dream. His dream was clean and pure, and you know what it was. I'm an old-fashioned guy in this respect. I still believe that Dr. King was right. I still believe that Brown versus Board of Education was correct in telling us that separate schools are inherently unequal. That's my belief. Um, and you know, there's a heartbreaking, um, <laughs> a heartbreaking comment that I, I often hear from black leaders around the country, black educators, 
at least those who have some sense of history, um, I'm sure you've heard it too. If you want to see, they'll say to Jonathan, if you want to see a really segregated school in, in, in our hometown, wherever it is, um, look for a school that's named for Dr. King. Um, and it's true, everywhere I go, almost every city, I could find a school like that. And I'll go there and I don't, and, you know, I might see a dozen white kids sometimes. Uh, I, I don't know, why, why do we name those schools for Dr. King? Why do we name those schools for a segregated school for someone that black people love? Why don't we name those schools for someone they don't like? You know, Clarence Thomas Academy, <laughs> self-help, and self-hate, something like that. Donald Trump Academy. <laughs> Say the name of Dr. King for a school that lives up to his dream. That's my own belief. So we're talking about poverty in children today, and we're also talking about race. Race and class are not congruent, but statistically, they're closely intertwined. And now add to all of this the inequalities our poorest children undergo before they even come to us in public school. I'm speaking now, of course, of the gross disparities in preschool education for our children. In view, of, I, I was just in Washington and I was talking with my old pal, I think of her as my big sister, Marion Wright Edelman. You know who she is? The chair of the founder of the Children's Defense Fund, and she and I have been fighting over this issue for years together. I don't mean we've been fighting with each other, we've been fighting side by side. In view of what we know of cognitive development or cognitive starvation in children two and three and four years old, the denial of preschool opportunities is one of the greatest injuries we can inflict upon the the young mentalities of children. Yet most everywhere I go in low-income districts, a frightening large number of children coming into kindergarten have not received any kind of pre-K opportunity at all. And every, every state means well, you know, intends to do this someday. I, I hear this everywhere. Uh, in North Carolina, it does have a full day, a full year pre-K program, but um, only 21% of eligible children can get into it. Um, this is a pattern almost everywhere. I, you know, I don't look at statistics. Um, I know these days the magic buzzword is data-driven. But you know, these think tanks in Washington create their own data. I don't, I, I don't, I don't go by data. I go by the real world. I go in the kindergartens and I ask the teacher, you know, how many of these little boys and girls got preschool before they came to you? And uh, typically the teacher takes me by the arm and looks around the class and she'll say to me, it's usually a woman, she'll say, if you mean real pre-K, not child care, not grandma care, not something amateurish, but the kind of rich developmental preschool, your Harvard classmates purchased for their children and grandchildren, maybe half the children in this class got something for one year. And meanwhile, the children of the privileged I know, and I, you know, I know wealthy people, um, and, and they still like me for some reason. <laughs> And they'll invite me to dinner in their home still to talk about these issues. Um, but they're always nervous with me because they're, they're afraid I'm going to say something horrible and you know, ruin the dinner party. I'm polite. I say that the dessert. Great for the coffee and the creme brulee. Then I let them have it. And they tell me what they do for their kids and grandkids. Typically, they're, and this is not just in New York City, this is all over New England, it's true in the affluent areas around every city in America. Um, typically, they 
they purchase extraordinarily expensive, beautiful, uh, full day pre-K for their children starting at the age of two and a half, or even, or even two. Uh, and these are expensive. I mean, they invest a lot in their children's earliest years. In New York City and New England, the top pre-Ks now cost forty-five to fifty thousand dollars for a two-year-old. Two-year-olds don't weigh much, you know. That's what, I always wonder how much is that per pound. But, <laughs> uh, you know, and, and then a few years later, they're all rich and poor. They're all in first, second, third grade, and suddenly they have to take high stakes exams, right? And uh, which ones do you think will score above proficiency and be la maybe labeled talented or gifted and set on that inevitable road that leads to honors and AP in high school and on to the college of their choice? And which ones, on the other hand, are likely to be labeled developmentally delayed, you know. I'm going to be blunt with you. Um, this is not some sort of accidental oversight on the part of government. It's, it's gone on far too long and we know too much about neurological and psychiatric development in children. Uh, this is a highly conscious amputation of potential, a diminishment of destinies, an act of uh, a quiet uh, but nonetheless destructive um, cognitive genocide, and it's simply unforgivable. And you know, my wealthy friends will say to me, when I describe these needs, they'll say to me, um, well, uh, what are you proposing? I'll say, I'm proposing that the richest country in the world do what they do in all these Scandinavian countries and much of the world, in much of the developed world, which provide universal pre-K, very high level. Not, you know, not, 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 drill, not drill and kill pre-K. You know, not, not test prep pre-K. But glorious pre-K, pre-K where play is considered a part of learning. Um, pre-K with wraparound services, pediatric, pediatric uh, examinations, vision screening, dental screening, apparent, apparent components so parents are unable to read to their children, we'll teach them how to read. Instead of scapegoating the parents, we'll give them a blessing too. And my friend said to me, Jonathan, that would be awfully expensive. And uh, I say, yes, it would be. And that's when they look at me, these educated people, allegedly logical people, not mentally ill people, you know, <laughs> largely, you know, allegedly sane people. They'll say to me, Jonathan, Can you really um, help those kinds of children by throwing money at them? Wow. Throwing, huh? you ever heard that? Say, is throwing, you know, can you really solve these problems by throwing money at them? I don't know a better way to deal with poverty. <laughs> you know, uh, you know, anyway, I didn't, I didn't come here all the way from Boston to drown you in despair. Um, I came to look for hope and to look for transformation. And some of the most important transformations that our nation needs at this point are going to depend on good young people like so many at this university today who will, who will go into the classrooms well prepared in all the areas of elemental skills and higher order skills, I don't in any way diminish their significance. You know, I'm not one of those flaky 
you know, types. Remember the open classroom? Anyone old enough to remember that? You know, I, I always was against that. You know, they, 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 these hippies would go to a poor black community and set up a school where, um, you know, nobody taught anything. It, it was, you know, like adult abdication. And, you know, to, to teach a reading lesson was an act of oppression. Remember that? I used to call those the wheat germ people. And, uh, you know, they'd say, Mrs. Jones would come up and say, hey, my fifth grader, they can't read a word. And they'd, they'd say, don't worry, Mrs. Jones. You have a beautiful child. You know, when she senses her own organic need, <laughs> then, then she'll tell us that she wants to read. No, I, I'm not like that. I don't want you to cons think, think that I'm you know, insane. I, 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 adults have a role in the lives of children. Um, but um, I think it's also important, and, and maybe even more important, that the, the teachers who are going into our public schools also have the gift of critical empowerment, of what I would call ethical audacity, strong voices, in the face of policies and practices that have proven highly damaging to children. That's my own belief. Um, for a long, long time, teachers-to-be have been given the misimpression that, um, that to be, quote, professional is also to be sort of the political version of an eggplant. You know, have no flavor. No spices, no strong personality, um, and that's uh, that's not a good idea. You know, who knows the children better than that teacher? You know, you know we have all the outside experts in the world, and all these pontificating, so-called no excuses people, uh, cruising into town from Washington. You know what I mean? That is no excuses people. You know, no there's no excuse. Um, there are plenty of excuses. These are people who don't know the taste of poverty. But um, we, need, we need teachers um, who can stand up in the, in the, in the, in the face of, 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 of truly brutal attitudes towards children. One of the greatest problems that we're facing now, and I'm sure you knew I was going to get to this, is this very peculiar an obsessive and I believe pathological mania of repetitive testing of our children. This is too much, too much. I'm not opposed to testing. I had to pass a couple of tests to get into Harvard and uh, maybe wanted you to get out. But um, what's happening now is unhealthy. Um, and, and as you know, it has an almost, an almost inevitable consequence of pressuring our teachers, especially in schools that serve the black and brown and poor, to teach only to the test uh, and to that narrow slice of skills that can be measured most simplistically by numbers on a standardized exam. All of which, in far too many schools I visit, is taking up as much as two-thirds of the year between the, the test, prep, pre-test, the test itself, post-test. I go into principal's offices in elementary schools at certain times of the year, and I don't see any books where there used to be all these children's books on your table just piled high with this miserable stuff from Pearson and, uh, you know, the park or whatever the newest variation of the test might be. Um, uh, and of course, it's squeezing out everything that cannot simplistically uh, be reducible to numbers. So, in terms of anything like cultural capaciousness, it's a starvation diet. And let me tell you, it's having a disparate effect. It's not as bad in affluent and largely white communities where parents and principals know their kids will do okay. 
and uh, don't allow. And, and, and we're well-educated parents would, you know, would rise up in arms if, if faculty tried to turn their children into little testing robots. Um, and when they want their kids to indulge their curiosity, their sense of inquiry, their sense of exploration, where they want their kids to ask smart questions, where they want their kids to grow up with critical intelligence in order to interrogate reality, and to, in order to interrogate the status quo. Um, and, so and so they don't allow the, the test you know, to shrivel the curriculum. It's in the poorest schools, and the schools that serve the poorest children, um, that even very good principals I know, are, um, and, and I'll say parenthetically, I can't condemn them. They're running scared. And, you know, they cannot pump the scores by two percentage points or whatever other arbitrary number the government demands. Um, they're afraid they'll lose their jobs. Uh, and worse, see their school shut down, uh, handed over to a profit making corporation, you know, to run as, you know, some kind of voucher school or charter school. So um, they so they so they're telling their their teachers not to they'll say to their teachers, it's all well and good that when you were at uh, this wonderful college of education, you learned about um, child centered learning and the legacy of John Dewey and Piaget and Rousseau and Eric Erickson. Do you still read Eric Erickson? I hope so. How many do? Yeah. Um, they'll say it's all good that you studied that in college, but forget it now. Uh, uh, you're, I don't want you to waste a, a single moment of the day on anything that will not have a payoff on, in the scores. This is the message going to the teacher. Do not let those children wander from the standards of the state, or now it's the common core, whatever it might be. There's no time to let your students ask too many questions or indulge their curiosity or originality. Curiosity will not be tested. Spontaneity, originality, will not be tested. Delight in learning will not be rewarded on the state exam. Delight, in fact, could be a dangerous distraction. It could get you way off track. Leave delight and spontaneity to children in the suburbs. That's what I'm hearing everywhere. I'm sure, not everywhere except, except North Carolina. <laughs> And no, it's, it's everywhere, I'm being blunt with you. It may be modified somewhat due to the enlightening influence of, of a, a university, but it's everywhere. That's something, there's something odd about this number thing. Um, the, um, you, know, I, you know, I know a lot of the people who, who initiated all of this in, uh, in Washington at the time that no Child Left Behind was being debated and enacted. And since then, um, the worsening of, of the same agenda in Race to the Top and so forth. Um, and, you know, these people, um, there, there's something about numbers for them. They're numerically addicted. It's as if, and it reminds me of mental hospitals. I'll tell you why. My father was a very great psychiatrist, and uh, he used to take me with him to the back wards of, of big mental hospitals where um, people, you know, were, who were extremely ill, who would, uh, they had this uncontrollable restlessness, and their restlessness could only be subdued by making lists of things with numbers. And that seemed to relieve their anxiety. You know, I think that's what was wrong with Arnie Duncan. 
I, I don't, it's not crazy, but, uh, uh, but uh, you know, I think that's, that's what was wrong with Clarence. Was it Page, I think, you know? Well, they were equally bad, one for Bush and one for President Obama. And, and now, you know, after all of this, by the way, on, on his retirement, uh, Secretary Duncan told us that it didn't work. And he was sorry. <laughs> it was a mistake. Yeah. But what this does, and it, and it keeps rolling on and on, is it, um, it, it, subdues the, it subdues the ability of children to ask questions, to tell stories. The problem, the problem is that children want to ask their questions. They want to tell their stories, and the little ones, especially first and second grade, are gifted artists at subverting lesson plans. <laughs> I think that's a, an entitlement God gave to them, and, and to ruin all the work you did on Sunday afternoon. And uh, they'll wave their fingers in the air. You know, you're in the midst of a lesson that, for which you're going to be judged. Some coach is going to come in and judge you if you're not doing, you know, uh, long O or short E at that moment in the morning, or consonant blends, you know. And, did you know what those are? Yeah. I hope so. You know, you sort of do that at 9.20 or something like that. And, you know, these little ones are waving their hands, you know, and they really, first, second grade is our squirmy little people. They don't stay in their chairs. They defy the laws of gravity. And um, they're waving those hands. And I go into the class, sometimes the teacher lets me take the class, because the teacher will say, children, Mr. Jonathan, they, they always, Use my first and say, Mr. Jonathan's a writer, he writes books, and we're writers too. We write little books. Um, so ask him questions. And there his hands go up, and you know, they're making these horrible sounds. Ooh, 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 like that. And there's always a little one right in front of me. I'm thinking of a little girl I remember who um who had who was just three feet away from me. She's, waving her fingers as she's going to poke out my eyes and um, making this horrible sound. Ooh, ooh, ooh. As if she were going to die if I didn't call her. And I didn't want this little girl to die. So I called her. And she looks up at me with this sweet, innocent face and she says, what? She didn't have a thing to say. And she just wanted me to recognize that she was there. Um, so, you know, so here's the situation. There's the teacher in the classroom with the outcome. Do you use that word outcome or do you say objective? No, none of you have been in schools recently? <laughs> well, in most of the country they'll say like goal, objective, um, outcome of the lesson. And they write out what it is. In many states, most states, they have to write it out. In fact, in New York, uh, they have to write it in the exact language of the state standard. So uh, I came into a third grade in the Bronx um, where a very good teacher um, who was, he wrote on the board, and now they do it on an electronic board, um, he wrote English Language Arts, or ELA, uh, number 65B. I had no idea why that number would be of any interest to the children, but there it was. <coughs> it said, children will demonstrate. Have you ever written anything like this? All right. Children will demonstrate their proficiency at producing a narrative procedure. <laughs> I kept looking at that, and I was thinking, I don't think you can do that. <laughs> I don't think you can produce a procedure. You can produce a baby, but you develop or carry out a procedure, conduct a procedure, am I right? Yes. So I, I whispered this to the teacher. He said to me, Jonathan's horrible syntax, I said, well, what does it mean? I, I majored in English. I don't know what the heck that means. He said, it just means write a little story. 
I said, well, why don't you put that on the board? Oh, no, I can't. The curriculum cops will come around and I'll be in trouble. Um, so, you know, I see this everywhere. So there's a teacher, now I'm thinking of a specific uh, second grade teacher whose class I observed for a year in Boston. Um, and um, <clears throat> this was her first year of teaching. Uh, she was right out of uh, Swarthmore, you ever heard of that? Yeah. And then she'd done a year at Teachers College at Columbia, and this was her first job. And um, she's got the standard written on the board, whatever it is, the outcome. And um, <laughs> suddenly a little boy, and this is a real child, I remember, his name was Reginald. Um, well, it still is, you know, he's still alive. <laughs> um, he raises his hand and very sweetly says, Teacher, and she's thinking, Reginald's a good little boy, and I know he likes me, so maybe he's going to help me reach my objective. I'll take a chance. So she says, yes, sweetie. And um, he says, guess what? They always do that. See, they'll never tell you anything. You have to guess. And there's no point in saying I can't guess, because they'll just say guess anyway. So she says, what? And he says, yesterday on Sunday, my auntie and uncle took me to the zoo. And guess what? And now she, no, she's lost it. But she says, what? It's too late now. She says, what? And he says, and I saw a baby bear that had just been born. And they let me touch his nose. And it was wet and warm. And off he goes piling on his hands and butts for one of those glorious, eternal run-on sentences <laughs> at which six and seven-year-olds are almost as good as William Faulkner. <laughs> and sometimes at the end of all those hands and butts, if they don't interrupt, there's a piece of hidden treasure where that little child unveils something deep and secret in his soul or in her soul. And good teachers use that piece of hidden treasure as the key to unlock motivation. That's what wonderful teachers do. But in all too many schools these days, the teacher has to cut him off. And we'll never find that treasure. And we'll never know what lies within that child's heart. I hope you all uh, combat this um, this dreadful tendency. It's um, it's terrible. Uh, listening to children is terribly important. It is wasted time, you know. And if you you know if you silence their voices now, some of them, you know, if you lock them into silent stone, some of them will never have the Nerve to uh, to speak in their own words again when they get into the upper grades, uh, when we want to draw them into uh, good, intelligent, and decisive conversations. And they'll get to college if they get to college, and they won't be able to participate in in demanding dialogue. Uh, well. Where does that leave us? No, no one teacher, no one principal, no one educator can change all of this, obviously. But each of us can change a good big piece of it. We can do it in the classroom, and you're going to hear today a whole lot of strategies for the ways in which invented people have tried to make a difference, sometimes with success. In my, in my most recent education book, Fire in the Ashes, I describe a number of ways that teachers and principals I've, I've observed and known have empowered children <coughs> against all odds to rise above almost every obstacle they face. Uh, have any of you read 
some of my recent books, some of my books have described a little girl in the South Bronx whose nickname is Pineapple. How many of you are familiar with that? Oh, I'm so glad. I'm going to tell her when I get home. But, uh, she's famous in Raleigh, North Carolina. Uh, she was a little girl I met when she was in kindergarten. Very bossy little girl. The first day I met her, I, I was leaning over her shoulder, her right shoulder. The teacher asked me if I'd give her a little help. And uh, she looked up at me and she said, please stand over my left shoulder or, you, or I won't pay attention. So I moved and then and she paid attention to me. She just had a thing about shoulders, you know. But when, by the time she was in fourth grade, she um, used to give me instructions about the way I dressed. She, she said that once she fingered my suit, I only had two black suits, and they're probably the same ones I had then, and she fingered the lapel, so the way my mother would have done it, you know, and it, because it was shabby, you know. You know how mothers will do that. They'll say, you're not going, you're not going to speak in Raleigh in that suit. <laughs> and it's, that's how she did it. She said, Jonathan, I want you to look respectable. And she said, next time you're in New York, um, over there, okay, over there, the kids in the Bronx, man, you know, where white people go shopping in Manhattan, Fifth Avenue. She said, go into a real nice store and buy yourself a nice new suit. Do it for me. <laughs> so I did, and I had it there. Anyway, that little girl, I describe her in great detail in, uh, in my most recent book, and several other kids who really did rise ab above the odds. I don't know how she did it, but I know it took a lot of help from extraordinarily good teachers and principals who, who um, were willing to look beyond the, the test scores and find her real potential. And I might add, uh, she recently graduated from college in Rhode Island and is going to become a teacher. Um, but, but um, you know, so those are the things you can do within the classroom. But teachers and principals can also uh, do it as vocal and courageous public advocates for children in the world beyond the classroom. And I think that's terribly important. They can do more than passively hope for universal pre-K. They can bring this, this, this dere the present dereliction of our moral obligations uh, this dereliction on the part of influential people, they can bring this right into the political arena. And they should. Uh, if any of you are involved in high school, high school level, let me tell you the best medicine, the best preventive medicine for dropouts and disengagement on the part of students when they're 17 years old is um, three good years of pre -K. And if that weren't so important, why do you think wealthy people would buy it for their children, you know? I just can't believe that this nation still resists this. Finland, Finland is a prosperous country. They're not as rich as we are. And they've had this for decades, anyway. The teachers and principals can also resist the tensions identified with, with testing, they can, even if they give the test, you know, they have to give the test. But they don't have to make it so significant. They can elevate the love of learning for its own good sake alone and reject the fear of failure as the driving motivation in these schools that serve the poor. And basically, I'm telling you, everywhere I go, what tough accountability has really amounted to is, is sticking carrot methods of reward and punishment. Eric Erickson, the whole Ericksonian enlightenment is gone, and in its place is the legacy of the, uh, of the long discredited uh, rat control psychologist B.F. Skinner, the pure Skinnerian, and teaching 
and it's treating teachers the same way also. Uh, I, I have strong feelings about this. When I was a student, Eric Erickson was, was still teaching. And his disciple, have you ever heard of Robert Coles? Bob Coles, who wrote The Moral Lives of Children? Uh, he was my mentor, you know. Uh, good principles and teachers can also ardently oppose the overuse of unproductive patterns uh, of school suspension and expulsion, uh, which has become far too common in this country. You know, this over-eagerness to criminalize childhood uh, and start a boy, particularly boys, uh, particularly boys of color, to the African American boys, to start them when they're very young on, on the school to prison pipeline. Uh, you know, if, if we can't keep a little troublemaker in our classroom and deal with him or her effectively, there's something wrong with us. Um, I've done it, and I do not know anything about teaching, you know. I've seen wonderful teachers do it, but. Almost all of them who do it successfully have small class size. Um, so that's something else good principals and teachers should argue for strongly. But, you know, I mean, the, the tough guys who brought us No Child Left Behind and Race to the Top, they, if you've ever heard them on TV, these are, you know, these people who live in think tanks. Um, I won't name the think tanks, but you know which ones they are. And they're always on TV, and uh, they're always these little talking heads. And these are people who don't, they know nothing about children. Um, they know almost nothing about school, but they're always saying class size is irrelevant. If teachers weren't lazy and mediocre, they could do it, they could do a fine job with 38 children in the class. And there are plenty of schools in our major cities that start the year with at least 32 children in a classroom. I walked into a school in Los Angeles, a high school, with 40 children in 11th grade history. Um, uh, five more kids than chairs in the room. So five little boys had to lean against the wall. I asked the teacher, I, I read in front of the kids, I said, how in hell can you teach 40 kids, and don't ever ask that question. <laughs> she said, here, find out. And she handed me the class and left the room. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, sure it's true, a, a, a classroom wizard, a super charismatic teacher can probably manage a class of 32, 34, even 40, but a teacher's pretty good with I mean, 30 or 40 is going to be spectacular with 18 or 20. You know, we know that very well. And that's just a tiny sample of a multitude of ways that teachers and their principals can be more than excellent technicians of proficiency, by which I mean delivery of skills. There can also be true defenders of their students, uh, kids who have no voices in the world. Um, they could be public people, you know, well beyond the classroom. That's what I, you know, I don't know if I'll live to see that, but I hope I will. And I hope those will be the teachers who come out of this university and others like it. Well, I'm going to end this on a personal note, I'm at an age when um, time increasingly feels scarce. An awful lot of people that I've relied upon for guidance in my work with children all these years have been taken, have been taken from this world over the past 10 or 15 years. And you know, no matter what your age, I think, no matter what our age, I think we always look to someone whom we think a little wiser, a little older, to 
give us a sense of courage when we feel alone, you know. And uh, I relied on several people like that. I, I think especially of my best and oldest and closest friend in education. Uh, and not somebody openly political. Probably, but probably the best friend little children in this country had for half a century. A, a very sweet and gentle man, uh, and named Mr. Rogers, Fred Rogers. How many of you watched his program? Yeah. Yeah, I still watch the viewers. He was my beloved friend, and uh, by the way, he was a good listener to children, you know. Uh, once when we were in New York together, we had spoken at some event, uh, in some place like Carnegie Hall, uh, trying to, it was the, it was the 100th anniversary of the American Montessori Society, and it was over early, we were the speakers, and it was over early, it wasn't noon yet, so he said, would, would you like to take me up to the South Bronx to meet the children you've been writing about? He read some of my books, and I said, I would love to do that. And he's so modest, he said, uh, he's caught careful, he said, uh, do you think you would intimidate them? I thought that was funny. I, I had thought of Mr. Rogers intimidating anybody. <laughs> uh, I teased him, I said, I think they can handle it. And he said, how do you go there? There's, there's no trolley in New York. <laughs> I said, the quickest way is on the train. Any of you know New York at all? Number six train, straight up Lexington Avenue, 57th Street, Brook Avenue. Brook Avenue at that time was the heart of the, it was a very tough street. But that was the, the train stop for the neighborhood, which I've been writing all these years. Um, so we get on the train. He liked that idea. You know, we went down the smelly subway, get on the train, six stops to Brook Avenue. We get out there. Brook Avenue at that time, it's, it's cleaned up now, but at that time, that was the heart of the uh, heroin trade and crack cocaine trade in, in New York City, at least in the Bronx. It was a dangerous street. Uh, it was so dangerous that the drug lord, um, would, he rented squares on the sidewalk. You know those little cement squares? He rented squares out to his dealers. You know, so you could only sell on this square. And that square belonged to another dealer. And they had different brands of heroin. Uh, it was a tough street, because when I used to visit, uh, one of the things I always urge teachers to do, I say, if you have a problem, you can't, the parents don't come up. Sometimes the parent of the child who gives you the most trouble is the one who doesn't come up to school when, you, when you'd like her to. Uh, I always say, go to her home. You know, go, to, go to the parent's home. Go to the child's home after school. I used to do that. And uh, so, um, the grandmas used to say to me, um, I, I see you. The, grand, the, the grandmas used to say to me, you're not going to walk back to that subway alone at midnight, so they'd walk me there. Anyway, there was Mr. Rogers and I walking up the street. I wondered if anyone would know who he was, and indeed they did a sanitation truck came screeching to a halt, and a, 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 a middle-aged black man jumped out of the Truck and gave him a big hug, lifted him up the wall, up the, lifted him up the ground. And we went to a public school. I never go to what I call a boutique school that has extra money, you know, for Eli Broad or something. I go to a regular public school. And, um, and after that, we went to the after school that was just around the corner in an Episcopal church nearby. Um, a, a, a school that did not compete with the public schools, but try to reinforce them. And we walk in and the place is packed because kids are just arriving there. School is out and there are 90 kids packed into that room where they first arrived to get their snack before they went for their lessons. And uh, there was a little boy whom I knew pretty well named Mario at the far end of the room. Uh, uh, about six years old. A little plump, not that, but plump. 
get a round face, look like an olive with a smile painted on it. And you know, children that age, if they don't like you, can make it all too clear. But if they do like you, you're in for it. And he spotted Mr. Rogers and went straight across the room with his arms spread out. And he was a little pudgy, he looked like a jet powered bumblebee or World War II attack plane. The moment of collision, he wrapped his arms around Mr. Rogers' head, right around his head, because he was sitting down, kissed him on his forehead, looked him right in the eyes, and said, Welcome to my neighborhood, Mr. Rogers. I never forgot that. And he did say to me once, he said, the sorrow is that we don't say the same to Mario. Uh, well, now he's gone. And when I knew that he was dying, um, I used to pray. I used to pray to God. I used to pray, hmm, let him have one more year. And sometimes I bargain a little, I say, two years maybe? I, I, I'm Jewish, I don't know why, I feel that I can bargain with God a little more than you can because we knew him longer. Some <laughs> uh, would say, he's such a good man, let him live forever, you know. But of course, I knew he can't, none of us can. We all know we're gonna die someday and lose the ones we love the most to death the old trees and the innocence and foolishness of children will outlive us all. My friend's life goes so fast. Use it well. Thank you. Good luck. <laughs>